You are in frame. and book snake was what my grade school principal called me because I read so many books and I, I simply couldn't be classified as a bookworm. Now this was in grade school and I've gotten a little bit worse since then. I love the Toronto Public Library and by the end of the stuff I hope that all of you will love it too and will go, well if not today, tomorrow to your local library and have lots of fun. Out of curiosity, how many people here have a library card? Ooh, everyone, fantastic, are carrying the library card right now. Go to the library every week, have hit the 50 book checkout limit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the checkout limit is 50 books, you can renew things twice, and if you're like me, you can also link your accounts with other, with other people, like husbands or wives, and check out books on their account. <laughs> this has come in handy. Is this 50 a month or 50 a 50 year? at any given time. Oh, okay, so yeah. if you return things, you can check out more. Have you done it? Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, actually, I've gotten to the point where sometimes I'm standing at the checkout lane and I've got a stack of books there and I'm like, beep, 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 beep. Uh, I'm sorry, this one puts you over the limit. I've, got, I've had the librarians cut me off. Actually, no, the librarians know and they say, oh, you can check it out on your husband's card. So. I track my library checkouts from October 2011 to, well, now, because it's an automated system that keeps doing this, uh, which covers about 95 and a half weeks uh, from the time I downloaded the data. The, the, the data that I'm going to share today is a little bit limited in that there are two other people in the household, some of whose library cards I tend to abuse on a re regular basis. So uh, instead of dropping their numbers, because sometimes I have to check out stuff on their card, and sometimes I still watch my husband's. DVDs and read his books. I just included everything in the website. Also, the date analysis that I will show you is by due date. So it doesn't actually really reflect when I read something, but it should be in the right ballpark. I will read everything. I read maybe about 68% of what goes through the shelf. So those are the little asterisks. The big headline is the library is an amazing money saver. I mean, seriously amazing. But before I get to, to that part, let me show you the, this, this is the one I did, I tracked the library. How did I do it? Well, this is the library system. You can log in, you can check how many things that you've checked out. But what's really interesting is that if you look at the source code of the page, you can actually get a lot more data than they show you. They will show you the unique identifier. This is a barcode, actually, that shows up on the, on the sticker. They'll show you the Dewey Decimal System uh, classification. So that's this uh, 7453, which says it's a drawing book. You have the uh, author, you have the some kind of date, you have, you have the title. So I wrote a script that extracted this information and put it into my own system. So I have, a, I have something that tells me what to do, which is great when you're juggling some gazillion odd books. And then from there I downloaded the data into a spreadsheet where I'm going to do, uh, where I did a lot of these manipulations that I'm going to show you. Okay, uh, a little bit of Excel manipulation to get the data, and this is what I found. Holy cow! Right? So we borrow, we, borrow, we borrow about 10 movies a month, which is about two or three a week, which is nice for getting through laundry and doing all that stuff. And it turns out that this is actually a lot of money. Um, I borrow a ton of books. And again, if you say, well, you know, I probably don't, I wouldn't buy all these things, but that's still a huge chunk of my entertainment and education budget. So that's, you know, key takeaway, if you listen to nothing else, that's a too long to listen summary. Go to your library, it is awesome. So I'm going to share with you some of the interesting things I've learned about my reading habits based on tracking all of this stuff. It turns out that I read vastly more nonfiction than anything else. In fact, this fiction contains like eight science fiction books, which is like, what? I only read eight science fiction books in this entire span of time. Most of the time I read a lot of nonfiction, but you know, some movies and other things there too. So I knew that, but I didn't know how many movies we watched until I added up the numbers. I actually tend to read in bursts. So some some months, this so each bar here represents a single month. You know the relative heights which will say uh, how many of that item were, uh, were checked out uh, was checked out. Um, and you can see here that my nonfiction goes up and down. It spikes when I have more free time. It goes down a little bit more. And despite the seeming up and downs here, there actually there's actually no correlation between how many book I, how many books I read and how many movies I watch. So it seems that movie watching doesn't get in the way of reading, or vice versa. 
uh, fiction tends to be up and down a lot too. Uh, as mentioned, I really skew towards nonfiction, and if you look at the, the Dewey Decimal System categories, it's really interesting to start seeing how your reading breaks down. I read a lot of management books, I read a lot of personal finance books, but I also read about uh, uh, cookbooks that I actually hardly ever cook from, um, a lot of writing books and all that stuff. And then this is me panicking about setting up my own business, and so reading all the, all the legal books that would make me comfortable. Uh, likewise, uh, bursiness in, uh, I tend to generally read about management, but sometimes other subjects, you know, they come and go in terms of interests. In addition to tracking my library stuff, I actually also track my time. And if you've come to Quantified Self uh, talks before, you might have seen some of my presentations on this. So I, because I track my time, how much time I spend in different activities, I can actually go back and say, how much time did I track spend, um, reading nonfiction over that period of time that I was looking at. And it turns out that I spend maybe half an hour per book if you uh, adjust the numbers to compensate for the fact that sometimes I'm reading when I'm on the subway or eating breakfast or whatever else. Uh, which works out to be just right because most books are full of crap. <laughs> and so you can actually skim through them very quickly, decide that this book is actually more crap than good, and then move on to the next one. So that's another tip that I'd like you to take away from this, is that you don't have to read everything, you know, kind of look at it to see whether it makes sense, and then look for the one or two good things that, that, that's in a book, and then sometimes you'll find a really good book, and that one you'll slow down and you can read for like two hours or four. Um, what do I do with all this reading? Well, most of the time I, most of the time I don't do anything, because as I mentioned, most books are crap. For some of the books that actually have really good writing, then I store that in my, my quotes file or my book notes. I turn things into blog posts, I write visual books, uh, well, I draw visual book summaries like this. Um, and also, I, I, I'm the person that people talk to if they want to know what books they should read. Well, not that many people want to know what books they should, they should read, but I will tell them. So that's, that's what I've learned from tracking all of this stuff. Um, and my next steps in terms of analysis are, well, looking at all the things that I probably should get around to see. Um, I've been going through my backlog of classic science fiction movies that I haven't watched. This week I watched 12 Monkeys, and uh, yesterday I watched Soil and Green, which actually still works even if you know the punchline. So, the library has lots of stuff. Um, I, I regularly go through the new releases list. Every, uh, every 15th of the month, the library put a list of the, the new things that are available. Um, but I also so I, um, I started looking at Amazon recommendations as well, and taking more notes. The last thing I want to leave you with is go to your library, check it out. Um, you can order lots of things online and have it delivered to the branch close to you. So it is a totally awesome thing. And if you want to track all of this stuff, again, check out the source of the webpage and you will find that data encoded in there. So that is my very geeky story. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned that you track the amount of time that you spend reading, yes. and there was a source at the bottom that was quantified awesome. Uh, yes. So quantified. What, what is that? How do you track this this particular okay. data? So quantified awesome is a website that I, uh, of course, am not currently online with. Um, quantifiedawesome.com is a website that I built for myself because I wanted to track my time, my clothes, other things like that. Basically, if I say, oh, you know, what, I'm going to spend part of this afternoon reading. When I start reading nonfiction, I'll just type in nonfiction or non-f because I'm lazy. And it will select my category for that. And it'll pop it in. And then when I'm moving on to, say, cooking dinner, then I will type cook. And it will change to that. So I use it to, uh, to keep track of how much time I spend playing for the two and other things in life. Yes? How was uh, the first 20 hours? Uh, it was... It, it was um, well, basically, the, the key parts of the book are all in the first chapters. You can actually just spend like, a couple of minutes, well, not a couple of minutes, but very quickly reading it. Um, and then the rest of the chapter is just going to how he's applying this idea to lots of different uh, fields. The, the basic idea is that it actually doesn't get, it doesn't take that much time to get to the point where you're enjoying a new interest. So just go, you know, stick your butt in that chair, learn it for 20 hours, and then give up if you want to. Right. <laughs> yes. So do you do speed reading or do you actually have to read so much? Um, I, I, I do speed reading, so, so uh, I skim, 
Um, I also look at the table of contents to see whether there's a chapter that I want to jump to first. But the, the truth is, you actually don't really need to, to read all the words. So if you're, you know, if you're project scanning, your peripheral vision will pick up a fair bit. If you find it's that someone's saying something interesting, you can always go back a little bit and read some more. But for the most part, you're looking, for, especially if you're reading, say, for example, seven different books on the same topic, you'll find that a lot of the material gets repeated or just slightly rephrased, or people are writing about the same thing in different ways. So you can very quickly go through all of that stuff and just focus on the, the things that are unique about this book. Yes? Um, how have you noticed kind of um, decided differences between the quality and, and character of the things that you read in books as opposed to things that you've read online? Um, yes. So I get I I usually get a, a lot more information density out of books. Uh, I find that typesetting does matter. So if I come across a badly typeset book, I find well, I don't really want to read this as much. Um, and of course, there are there are these amazing insightful bloggers that don't really publish books that often, or you know, or and basically their books are collections of blog posts, so I might as well just read them online. It's you know, it's, it's kind of a mix. I tend to go to books if I want more depth. Or also, if I want to read about things that maybe not either not a lot of other bloggers have covered, or so many bloggers have covered that there's I'd be wading through a lot of duplicate content if I was searching. Yes. Are you use any software to tracking that, or you have to design by yourself? Um, fortunately, since you are all well, most of you are in Toronto. If you are interested in this. And you trust me with your library card, I promise not to check stuff up on it because that would be pointless. I would have to go and find you and pick it up. Um, you could theoretically sign up for Quantified Awesome and it would probably do that kind of checking for you. But if you want to write your own and you are a programmer, then as mentioned, you can go to the source and extract the data. Um, libraries, well, this our, our library doesn't have an API, so it doesn't it doesn't make that data available for people to easily use. I would love to have that if that was there. In the meantime, this is the brute force way to do it. You have to get the data while you still have the book checked out, right? Yes. Because it doesn't keep the history. Right. So my system automatically checks it every day at 1 in the morning so I don't feel guilty about using the library website by doing with my computer. <laughs> yes. Has your monitoring changed your behavior? Um, in a way, yes. Uh, there are some books that I have quietly elided from this analysis because actually they, they fall off in the bottom of the, the what you call it, the, um, the, the categories because there's some unusual categories that show up in my books uh, or things that give away stuff that I'm not quite ready to talk about yet. But <laughs> <laughs> but actually really cool. And the main thing that the monitoring has helped me with is that in a household with two, sometimes three very active Barbie cards, this system will tell me when the first due date is and what's due. So instead of uh, the three of us having to check what's what's coming up, I can just collect all of that stuff and grab it and then take it to the library. So, awesome. Next person up. <laughs>